welcome. I'm so excited to have an amazing guest here with me today, and that is Bruce Music with Love at First Fight. Welcome, Bruce. Thanks, Michelle. I'm thrilled to be back here. So happy to have you here as the man of the month and here on the YouTube channel as well. And really excited to um, have you share what I know is going to be so valuable to our listeners. So thanks again for joining me. It's an absolute pleasure. Yeah. So I'm Michelle Martin Johnson with Love Life Coaching. And many of you know that as part of my work, I like to interview men and get the male perspective. And I particularly love interviewing Bruce because he always shares things that I think are so incredibly valuable and unique. So Bruce, if you don't mind to jump in here, just share just a short little version of kind of how you started doing the work that you do and specifically a little bit about the work that you do. And then let's just jump right into the topic of um, love at first fight and how we can uh, set ourselves up for the best possible relationships. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. So I'm Bruce Music. I am an author, a speaker, a relationship coach, and I specialize in helping couples in conflict. So that's my speciality. And that all started because I was struggling with conflict in my own relationships. And maybe it was about 15 years ago when I suddenly had a light bulb moment realizing that the common denominator in all my failed relationships was the, the, the me. And uh, it was a humbling moment. And that's what really inspired me to start learning about relationships. And I made a kind of promise to myself that I would not stop until I figured out how to have a safe, secure, and fulfilling long-term committed relationship. And that's what I did. I started reading every book I could find. Then I started flying around the world to learn from some of the world's top relationship researchers, never once considering becoming a relationship coach professionally. I was just purely fascinated and I wanted to learn for my own sake. And uh, eventually, word kind of spread in the town that I live in that I knew a thing or two about relationships and people would start buying me lunch in exchange for some relationship advice. And after about the third of these lunches ended in the couple crying tears of joy in each other's arms again, I was like, hmm, this is actually quite fulfilling. And they were like, Bruce, you should really good at this. You should consider doing this professionally. And long story short, eventually Love at First Fight was born and I've been for over a decade helping struggling couples to reconnect, uh, get past their differences and get back on the same page together. So that's a little bit of my own story. I'm also married. Along the way, I met the woman of my dreams, who also turned out to be my greatest teacher. And I did the smartest thing I could have done. Probably the best decision I ever made was putting a ring on her finger. I have two amazing stepkids, Brandon and Anna. They're at the moment 21 and 25. And we live in the Dominican Republic on a beautiful little beach town called Cabarete. And if you're wondering where my accent from, I was originally born in South Africa. Enough about me. Over to you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Bruce. You and I were commenting on how many of us in the relationship space have found our way to it through our own challenges and through our own pain. And uh, it's, it's interesting because one of the things that's so fascinating about being in this space is that there's always more for us to learn, always yeah, more yeah. for us to learn. And being in a couple, uh, you know, I've been married now for 16 years is such an educational experience. So when you say Isn't that your true? wife has been your greatest teacher, I can really relate because it really is kind of like having this mirror, you know, we, we see ourselves in certain ways and, you know, we, a, a, a way to look at this is we look in the mirror, we think we see ourselves very clearly, but we don't always see, you know, the side view or heaven forbid the rear view. Um, <laughs> and when you're in partnership, you get a reflection back of some of the ways that you're showing up and some of your triggers some of the things that you might not have even known. And so it's a, it's a fascinating experience to be in the relationship space and to also be in a relationship and have the opportunities to learn. Mm -hmm. So what I'd love for you to do today, because we have people from all different, in all different situations listening, many who are single and who are wanting to have a great relationship and may have struggled in their dating lives and relationship lives like you and I did earlier on. And then people that are in relationships, maybe some newer relationships, or maybe some struggling, 
And I'm sure we have some people listening who are just right down struggling. So I know that's a broad swath, but I wonder if you can take us on a little bit of a journey. Okay. And the journey I'm going to take you on sounds like the different stages of relationships. Is that what you're wanting me to, mm -hmm. to go down? Okay. So I think uh, what's very useful to understand, let's create a big picture why this is important to understand. Um, if you're going to get into a relationship, you really need to understand some of the basics. Just like you, know, you wouldn't be allowed to drive a car without first getting instruction and then having to pass a test and then taking a, you know, a, a, a difficult driving test, a, a, you know, a practical test after the theory test. So expecting you to be able to get relationships right straight out the gate is just naive. Like none of us are born knowing how secure relationships work. And just like it would be impossible to figure out how to drive a car on your own, can you imagine trying to figure out what the clutch does and what the brake does and what the accelerator does, what the gear stick does, and how to combine those four things together in order to move the car forward? I mean, by the time you figured it out, you would have killed yourself or killed somebody else on the roads already. It's dangerous. And in the same way, relationships are also dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. The good news is, is that you don't need to know an awful lot to be able to be good enough to drive your relationship. So the first big idea I want to introduce you to is that relationships develop in stages. So just like we grow up in stages from perhaps being you know, a toddler to ending a teenager and then a 20-something, and hopefully we end up as wise old man or wise old woman one day. <laughs> so your relationship's also going to develop in stages, and it's going to develop through three fundamental stages, and most couples don't make it to the third stage. So I'm hoping that this understanding helps get you to the third stage. So the first stage is the stage we all know and love. It's called the romance stage. And it's a time where your brain is pumping out a cocktail of drugs. You're literally right. tripping balls <laughs> on oxytocin, on serotonin, on dopamine, and you're head over heels in love, falling in love with your partner. And its intention is to have the two of you bond together and kind of it gives birth to the relationship. Okay, so now there's you, there's your partner, and you've given birth to this third entity called the relationship. And that's the point of the romance stage. And many people incorrectly believe that this is what love is. This is not love. This is purely drug-induced infatuation. That is all it is. And for those of you who are struggling in your relationship right now and hoping to go back to the romance stage, the bad news is there's no going back. Once you've left the romance stage, you can't go back to it. The good news is on the other side, in the third stage, you can achieve a far deeper, more mature love that's so much more rewarding and fulfilling than the romance stage could ever be. So the romance stage is great. It serves a purpose. The purpose is to get you to bond and create a relationship uh, together. And it lasts anywhere between two months and two years, according to the research. Okay? And then somewhere around about the two-year mark, when one of you perceives some kind of permanence, then dun, 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 you enter the power struggles stage. Okay? Some of you are nodding your head going, oh, I know this one. <laughs> I know exactly what he's talking about. And this is the stage where most relationships end or break up uh, uh, or end in, end in a divorce. And the power struggle stage begins when either of you begins to perceive some kind of permanence to the relationship. So permanence could be represented by you decide to move in together or you decide to get engaged or you get married or you have a baby or anything that kind of represents, okay, we're together for the long term. Now suddenly your brain goes, okay, stop making those chemicals. No more love chemicals for these two. These two now need to learn how to separate, okay? So in the romance stage, we've learned how to bond together, almost in a codependent way, in a way that's not really healthily dependent because we're so desperately in need of each other, we can't live without each other. So in the power struggle stage, its purpose is to have a separate a little, but not so far that we lose the relationship, just a little, so that we can reclaim our autonomy, our independence together, okay? So then we get to have our togetherness and our separateness, okay? Our independence and our uh, uh, dependence. And 
this stage is a really, really difficult stage. It's characterized by a ton of conflict. You're going to end up fighting, or if you don't fight, you'll probably end up breaking up. Couples tend to do two things. They're either the, the explosive couple who are you know, at each other's throats and throw blowout fights, or they tend to shut, out, shut down and kind of pride themselves in the fact they don't fight at all. However, one of the predictors of divorce is the, pro, uh, the, the um, what's the word I'm looking for? The continual avoidance of conflict. So if you're not fighting, and I don't mean fighting like yelling and screaming at each other, I mean, if you're not engaging in conflict and resolving it, you're not going to stay together. So the power struggle stage is also designed to teach you how to resolve your conflict. And if you don't learn that lesson, you will end up breaking up. Or if you don't break up, you'll end up living in misery and suffering together. I've, you know, many of my clients have been together for 30, 40 years in the power struggle stage, and they just can't seem to leave each other. And they come to me as a last resort, having suffered for 30 or 40 years. Mm. So I think what's important, Michelle, to know about this is that it's normal. And that's what I want everybody watching here to take away from this. If you are entering into a time in your relationship where conflict starts to show up, that is a normal developmental stage. It's like going from toddler to teenager. You know, it's like it's the next big or, you know, young person to teenager. It's the next big developmental leap. And you've got to get through it. And you've got to go through it. There's no going around it. Yeah, it feels to me like this is also the stage where where people start to recognize that they're they're different and that their partner may not be perfect like if they're if they were in the romance stage and they at that point they thought their partner was perfect this seems to be the stage where they realize that their partner's not perfect if you're lucky enough to make it past your power struggle stage you arrive at the mature love stage and the mature love stage is where things get a lot easier and it's characterized by an ability to be able to resolve conflict. Okay, that's the big thing that's going to get you to the mature love stage. And I don't mean avoid conflict. I mean resolve it, like resolve it to completion such that it's no longer an issue in a way that bonds the two of you together and leaves the two of you feeling like teammates on the same team, on the same side together. And if the Roman stage was all about kind of becoming dependent on each other and bonding to create a relationship and the power struggle stage is all about separating so that you don't lose yourself and you can remain two autonomous people and have a relationship then the mature love stage is where you're able to be dependent on each other and independent of each other in a flexible way so when you when your partner requires you and needs to be dependent on you you can be there for them when you can also live your own separate lives and live your life together as a couple so you have both individual lives and a joint life and uh, it, it's a lot easier. Things get a lot easier. And it's often characterized by couples working on a joint project together. So this might be a business that they start. Um, for my wife and I, it's a project of riding around the world on our dirt bikes. We, it's one of the things we love to do together. We're always working on projects riding around the world. For other couples, sometimes it's working on building a family together. Very often, couples will start some kind of community project or charity and they'll work together as a team on a project that's inspired by their relationship, that, that their relationship almost gives birth to this idea that they work on together. That's one of the, the characteristics of the mature love stage. And most couples don't get there. And it's easy to fool yourself thinking that you're in the mature love stage because it sounds so rosy. But if you don't have the ability to resolve conflict, you're not actually in the, the, the mature love stage. You're probably still in the power struggle stage and just having a peaceful period until kind of the next wave comes and knocks you off your board, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. So I share all of this because I want you to see where the goal is, which is the mature love stage. And the obstacle you're going to have to go through is the power struggle stage. And just because your relationship is going through a power struggle stage does not mean that the person you're with is not the right person for you or that you're incompatible with them or that your relationship isn't the right relationship. Because I think many of us you know, growing up watching Hollywood movies kind of inadvertently picked up some really bad beliefs about relationships. One of which is, you know, if a relationship's hard work, then you're in the wrong relationship. The relationship should be easy. And that's just not the case. I mean, for some people, relationships are easier. If you had really securely attached parents, 
who modeled for you how to resolve conflict, how to deal with difficult times together, how to be a team together, then maybe you kind of infused some of their skills growing up. But for most of us, and this is, I think, borne out by the fact that we have a greater than 50% divorce rate, most of us weren't taught these skills. We, we didn't mm-hmm. infuse them from our parents. And our yeah. parents loved us. They just were human. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because a lot of times I think that we also, maybe because of the Hollywood movies and that sort of thing, we're so focused on the romance stage and the idealism of that and just kind of the fantasy of that like lasting forever that when we move into that power struggle stage, we think maybe something has gone terribly wrong. I think that happens for a lot of people. And yep. that's where maybe we start noticing our 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 partner has weird toes or, you know, they, we, we, we start seeing them as, as human and real rather than this ideal perfection of who they are. And I know because I work with a lot of women who are a little bit more mature, a little bit more, uh, maybe they've been single for a period of time or pursued more of a career, that kind of thing. They also, although they are really attracted to this romance stage, they're also worried about losing their identity or losing their sense of self or independence sure. on some level. So there's there's that kind of inner conflict that happens. And yet, I think that so often when they move into that power struggle stage, when they're getting to know someone or in a relationship for that period of time, and then it goes into the power struggle stage, they still interpret that as something wrong. We made a bad choice. Yeah. This partner is not right for me. We can't work it out, that sort of thing. And so, like you said, they never make it to that secure love stage. Exactly. And that power struggle stage is where we really mirror each other's dark sides. This is where your partner mm-hmm. reflects back to you the sides of yourself that you need to work on, that you need to shine light upon. And what better person to do that than your partner, except if the two of you are asleep. Because if you're asleep, then you will attract the person who's least capable of meeting your needs and most capable of of driving you to distraction, of really like driving you to tearing your hair out and driving you crazy. And the difference between whether or not you torture each other or whether or not you end up uh, supporting each other's growth purely comes down to your awareness. If you are aware of how to resolve conflict and work together as a team to move through the power struggle stage, chances are you'll support each other's growth. You'll heal, help each other heal your old wounds. All of us carry baggage with us from our childhood. Nobody escapes child, childhood without wounds. But if you're not aware, you'll just end up repeating the trauma from your past or the difficult situations from your past. You go round and round and round in circles, hurting each other. You know, re traumatizing each other and opening old wounds unnecessarily. And that's what I see lots of couples doing. And the only difference between the couples who figure it out and the couples who don't is awareness. And that's why I'm such a big proponent of you've got to learn how to get through your power struggle stage. You've got to learn how to resolve conflict together as a team, because if you don't, you're, you're going to battle. And that's why I dedicated my life to teaching couples how to do that, because that was what I most battled. With. And that's what made the biggest difference for me too. Mm -hmm. Well, and I also think once we reach that point of the power struggle stage, we then know each other well enough that we kind of know each other's tender spots or, you know, where we could poke or that sort of thing to, uh, we we know enough that we could potentially really hurt each other if we chose to go that direction. And sadly, some couples do that. Some couples, um, you know, poke the most vulnerable parts of their partner. And we know each other well enough to, to do that at that point. So this and I is think, like, yeah. and I think people that have had that experience, a lot of times are very terrified of relationships because of exactly. that. Exactly. Or what I think is even more common, Michelle, is we don't know each other enough to be able to poke each other and hurt each other. And because we don't know each other, we hurt each other inadvertently. And one of the mm-hmm. metaphors I like to use is the metaphor of, partner dancing okay like imagine you're in a partner dance okay and your partner dancing together one person leads and the other person follows so my wife and i love to dance salsa it's one of our our things we fell in love doing and in partner dancing a really great metaphor is if you imagine partner dancing and your partner suddenly says to you ouch you're like what and i'm like 
you stood on my toe. Yeah. I, I, what are you talking about? I didn't stand on your toe. We were just dancing. No, you hurt me. I know you did. I, 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 ow! And the like, I don't know what's going on with you. And you carry on dancing. And eventually they go, ouch, again. And I'm like, you did it again. You stood on my toe. Until eventually they storm off the dance floor. And you would have scratched your neck. I haven't stood on their toe. I don't know what's going on. None of this makes sense until you understand the person you're dancing with has a broken toe. And you don't know that they have a broken toe. So when you're dancing with them, what are the odds of you eventually brushing your foot up against their toe and standing on their broken toe? Incredibly high, okay? Now, imagine this, which is far more like, they don't know they have a broken toe. Neither do you know they have a broken toe. Neither do you know that you have broken toes too. Neither do they know that you have broken toes. Neither of you know about each other's broken toes. So there you are learning to dance. What do you do when you learn to dance? You stand on each other's feet often, okay? Right, right. And now both of you end up going, ow, ow, no, you hurt me. No, you hurt me first. No, you hurt me first. And of course, this explodes until they eventually separate and run off the dance floor and go, you know what? Screw you. I'm out of here. I don't want to dance with you anymore. And that's how most people's relationships look in the power struggle stage. Now, the metaphor that I call the broken toe is an unhealed wound from our past. Mm -hmm. And we all come into our relationships with these broken toes, these unhealed wounds. And to your point earlier, if, if you don't know each other well enough, you won't know where your partner's broken toes are, so you won't be able to not help yourself standing on them. You will, you will stand on them eventually. You'll both stand on each other's broken toes, and you'll both hurt your partner, not even meaning to. And mm -hmm. so a big part of the work that I do with couples is helping them identify their broken toes explaining them to the other partner so that they can make sense of their partner's reactions. And once they understand their partner's broken toes, they're like, oh, that makes total sense. That's why you always act like this when I do that. And suddenly it all starts to make sense. And they go, it's not because you're a jerk. It's not because you're an idiot. It's not because you're just a drama queen. It's because you have a broken toe because your mom did A, B, and C when you were 10 years old. I would have probably also reacted in the same way if my mom did A, B, and C when I was 10. I can feel compassion and empathy for you now. And therefore, I build tolerance. And when this happens together in a, in a, in a partnership, the couple learns how to dance together in sync and dance beautifully. So that's mm. my dance metaphor. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful, beautiful metaphor. And yeah, that really is so powerful and so true. Uh, when we don't understand or know, we, we can't pot potentially understand or know all of the, the wounds or things that each other are bringing into a relationship to be sensitive to that. With my husband, I feel like now having been married for 16 years, I feel like I know him enough, enough that I know the tender spots and the, and the vulnerable spots. And I feel like he knows that about me. Not, not to say there couldn't be some new ones appear because, you know, that kind of stuff happens. But but I think, yeah, or in earlier stages, especially in a relationship, how could we possibly know? So, yeah, we're we? dancing on each other's toes, broken toes, and not realizing it. And then thinking the other person does realize it and blaming them or exactly. or believing that they have some kind of ill intent or are not sensitive or aware or that sort of thing. And I can remember in one of our other conversations, Bruce, something that I thought you, that you said that was so beautiful was that even if we, even if we don't fully understand, but we know our partner is hurt to just be able to embrace our partner and say, I'm sorry that I hurt you. Yeah. I think that's so incredibly powerful and, and healing because uh, you know, at least even if we, even if we don't fully understand why our partner is hurt, if we, if we show that we care enough about them, that we can say, I'm sorry, I hurt you. Wow. Could that diffuse a whole lot of, a whole lot of turmoil and could be such a starting point for, for healing and togetherness as we move through these challenges that come up. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So another thing I would love for you to share, I know we just danced with this just barely in another conversation was this concept that you have of the hailstorm, hailstorm, <laughs> the, the, hail storm the, and frozen, the, the frozen balls of hail coming down and the, uh, and the turtle. 
And I just yeah. think this is, again, so fascinating and so um, instructive that I would love for you to share a little bit more about that with our audience, if you sure. would. Of course. So in the power struggle, there's a very common dynamic that shows up where one partner gets all worked up and the other partner gets all shut down. Mm -hmm. And in conflict, what tends to happen is the partner who gets more worked up perceives that the part, their partner is abandoning them in some way. And so they get all worked up to let their partner know, hey, something's wrong. I'm not okay. But they don't say, hey, something's wrong. I'm not okay. They usually end up pointing fingers at this person saying, you never listen to me. You know, I feel like you're never there for me. And I'm always, you know, waiting for you to show up to have these conversations. We never resolve anything. If you would just listen to me, things would be so much better. And of course, the more they point fingers, the more this person shuts down in order to protect a fight from escalating or, or in order to protect themselves from feeling more hurt. Now, the more they shut down, the more abandoned the worked up partner feels and the more worked up they get. And the more worked up they get, the more they shut down, the more worked up they get, the more they shut down and round and round this couple go until doors are slammed, they're sleeping in separate beds and they're not talking to each other for days. Okay? And I call, well, this, this is the most probably common relationship dynamic. It's called the demand withdraw dynamic. And I call the person who gets all worked up the hailstorm, like hailing down a storm of hail upon their partner, okay? And the person who shuts down, I call them the turtle because they hide kind of in their shell and disappear until they feel safe enough to poke their head out again. Um, and hailstorms and turtles tend to be drawn to each other like opposite poles of a magnet. Um, and they are two of six what are known as attachment styles. And they're the, the two most common ones, the hailstorm and turtle dynamic. And so if you can relate to this, I want you to know that you're normal. And as toxic as this relationship pattern is, there is a way to resolve it. And it's not a reason to end your relationship. It's very common in the power struggle stage. And I would guess 60% of the couples that I work with get stuck in this pattern. And my job is to help them get out of it. And what's so difficult about this pattern is that the two, neither of you can see what's happening. It feels like it's just overwhelming you. Like it has you and instead of you having it. And uh, when it overwhelms you, it's easy to just assume that it's their fault, that they're the problem. And the more we point fingers at our partner, the more they shut down and the more they defend themselves and attack back. And then the more, you know, the worked up partner escalates, the more they shut down and you're off to the races. And this pattern gets worse and worse until the worked up partner also shuts down and withdraws. And that's when both people leave the relationship. They might be living together, but they live together separate lives. Um, the relationship freezes over and becomes like a, a cold, you know, it feels like a cold winter has come over the relationship. Both of them are pretending they don't need each other. And both of them are pretending that they don't care about the other when the total opposite is true. They both need each other and they both love each other. They're just so both so hurt and they are so at a loss for how to break this pattern. They're too terrified to initiate anything, to initiate an apology, to initiate an I'm sorry. And this is so common. And the good news is, is again, you could thaw out this pattern and thaw out this cold winter that's come on the relationship and connect the two together. And I've started using a phrase that I coined called connect first, communicate later. And I coined this phrase because I truly believe that most couples therapists get it wrong. They try to teach couples communication tools first. They try to get them talking about their relationship problems, thinking they need tools and, and able to, to be able to talk through their problems together. Couples counselors do this. Uh, um, couples coaches do this. It's just probably the most common mistake that people helping couples make. And they try to teach communication tools. But my whole way of looking at it is I'll say to the couple, okay, when you guys were falling in love, did you, you need communication tools to be able to communicate? And they're like, no. I was like, you just spoke, right? And it flowed naturally, didn't it? It's like, yeah. I was like, you speak English, don't you? Both of you, right? And they'll nod. And they're like, okay. So 
what makes you think you need communication tools? It's kind of like we've been taught we need communication tools. Like, so what were you doing differently when you were falling in love than what you're doing right now in the past riddle stage? Like, you are, are high on drugs, tripping balls, stoned out of your mind on oxytocin. That's what you were differently, doing differently. And that connected the two of you. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to give you some drugs. No, I'm just kidding. We don't give them drugs. Um, <laughs> I teach couples how to connect, how to connect emotionally so their brain starts producing those same drugs all over again, the oxytocin bonding cuddle hormones, the feel-good serotonin and dopamine. And once couples start feeling closely connected again, they can start talking again about their issues in a way that's kinder, in a way where they both feel safe. They don't have to automatically jump to their automatic defenses or attack. And when they can do that and stay safely regulated with each other, the conversations they need to have flow naturally. Now, I'm not saying communication tools aren't necessary or aren't useful. Of course they are. I teach them all the time. They're just not the first thing I teach because Couples who get taught communication tools when they're not connected, turn them into weapons that they use to attack each other with. Mm -hmm. So most of you will have, you know, in our culture have heard of the communication tool that goes, when you do X, I feel Y. Right. Like when, when you don't wash the dishes, I feel disrespected. And it's meant to kind of keep you talking about yourself and not blame your partner. But when a couple's disconnected, like I commonly hear things like, uh, when you don't kiss me hello after work, I just think you're a stupid idiot and you're a jerk. <laughs> and, and now that communication tools become a weapon that's empowered the person to attack their partner. And of course, the whole relationship blows up. And you know, So I don't even touch communication tools for at least the first week or two working with my clients until they're connected enough. And I give them a bunch of exercises to get connected. And that's one of the most important pieces that I think you can take away from this interview when you're dating, especially if you're single and you're dating, is you want to focus on connecting first before you engage in any kind of conversation about anything that's on your heart that's important to you that might be a sensitive topic that you're afraid might uh, um, blow up first. Make sure you get connected to your partner first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's so powerful. And you're right, it does kind of go counterintuitive to a lot of the advice that's given out there for couples. And uh, yeah, if you're if you're not connecting, the other person's not necessarily going to be able to hear you with these communication tours, mm -hmm. the, the tools. If if you know the hailstorm is elevated thinking they're all right and the and the turtles hiding in there thinking, oh, my goodness, uh, this person is so crazy, unreasonable, hailing on me. Uh, it's They're not going to be able to communicate in exactly. their, when they're in that mode. One question I want to ask you that comes up sometimes uh, with uh, women that I work with, and I'd be curious to hear your your view on this. So some of the women that I work with are in relationships and dating relationships and kind of exploring, you know, if they go further and that sort of thing. And some of them have asked, like, how do I ask it, ask for what I want or ask for my needs to be met in a way without it sounding like criticism to a man? So this is, mm -hmm. this is going in a little bit different direction, but oh, my perspective. Yeah, my perception is, is that sometimes as women, and, you know, I've experienced being the hellstorm, and I've also experienced being the turtle in different relationships, which is kind of interesting. Do you find that, first of all, I kind of went into a little different question there. Do you find that in different relationships, we can show up in those different roles? If we're with somebody who's the same as us. Oh, okay. You'll primarily be a hailstorm, but if you end up in a relationship with another hailstorm who's more hailstormy than you, you'll end up adopting the turtle rule. Okay. Okay. So then back to my original question. My perception is that sometimes as women, we think we're asking or requesting things in a really nice way, but it sounds like or is perceived like criticism to a man. So I would love to hear your perspective on this. Okay. Perfect. So if you're asking and it sounds like criticism and your partner's getting defensive, then what's happening is they're perceiving you attacking them. They're perceiving a threat and at an unconscious level, their amygdala, the part of their reptilian brain, it's back here 
in the brainstem, which is responsible for fight or flight, is perceiving a threat. And they're either going to defend back or they're going to bolt, one of the two. And that's because you are being threatened when you're asking for what you want. And most of us don't realize that we're being threatening when we ask for what we want. And how we come across as threatening is by focusing on the other person's behavior and what we want them to do. So I want you to stop leaving your clothes on the floor. Now, to many people, that will sound like a reasonable request, but mm -hmm. to somebody on the receiving end of it from the person that they love, that can feel controlling and it can feel like an attack, like you leave your clothes on the floor and it is bad. I need you to stop leaving your clothes on the floor. And it like sounds like naughty, a demand. Like scolding a naughty little boy. Right. They might, it, and it might trigger, you know, uh, or it might remind them of how their mom scolded them when they were a naughty little boy. Um, but in any event, it, it, it fails because you're focusing on your partner and what you want them to do, not what you need. So you're saying, I need, you know, I need you to pick up your clothes on the floor, but that's not a need. Okay. The need is, I need an organized home. Okay. That's your need. That's what you need. So if you say, honey, I need to feel relaxed in our home. And the easiest way for me to feel relaxed in our home is when everything is in its place and organized. It would mean the world to me if you could do your best to remember to pick up your clothes off the floor uh, when you see them there. And it would really, like, I would love you for it. And it would help me feel a whole lot safer and more relaxed around our home. See how much softer that sounds because you're being mm -hmm. vulnerable. You're talking about you. You're not saying, I need you to pick clothes up off the floor. Mm -hmm. And that's how you communicate your needs. You talk about you. And these are many of the simple communication structures that I teach. That, and as you can see, they're not rocket science. You don't have to remember, you know, 25 different sentences and try and, you know, parrot them back to your partner. You just have to understand some very basic distinctions. Like when you're asking for what you need, talk about an internal need. Don't talk about uh, an external need or, or an action you need your partner to take. You can invite them to take that action. So I said in this example, it would mean the world to me if you could, next time you're wandering in the house, try to remember to pick up your clothes off the floor so I can feel safe. What I'm doing there is I'm uh, expressing the joy that my partner will create for me when they pick up their clothes. And most people want to leave their partner feeling happy. And I'm also expressing why it's important for me. It's important for me because it will help me feel safe. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have yeah. to be complicated. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting because so many things, we kind of work in the area of nuance. It's, it's like just some of these little tweaks, what seem like little tweaks can make a world of difference. It's, yeah. it's amazing. So another question I would like to ask you while I have you here, just because I love uh, hearing the male perspective and your perspective in working with couples is so let's say I'll look, let, let's give an example this is an example one of my clients has been dealing with uh in the past was her okay. partner kind of had this he he lost his job he's looking for another job but from her perspective he wasn't looking hard enough for the job and he wasn't doing it right so she decides she's going to try to help him you know, she's like sending him job leads by email and she's doing all these things to try to help him. And he gets mad at her mm -hmm. and he, she's she perceives that she's being helpful and he perceives that she's being controlling or interfering. Mm -hmm. So my my belief is that unless a man and this is, you know, maybe men and women are different this way. I don't know. But unless a man is like specifically asking for help the more empowering thing to do is to say something like, I believe in you. I know that you're working on this. I know you're going to find your way forward in this and empower him in that way and then do whatever she needs to do to feel secure. But what would you have to say about that? Like, this is another thing where I think women feel like they're being helpful. That's just an example, but women feel like they're being helpful and men perceive it as being controlling. And I'm sure it can go both ways. I'm sure it yeah. can happen. I just happen I don't to think it's a man woman thing. I think it's yeah, right. I just it's happen to work with the women. So I'm hearing yeah, sure. You're hearing one side of the story. Um, 
So I'm spot on in agreement with you. I think it's brilliant. I've got a couple of distinctions that will help perhaps make it clearer for the people listening. The thought process behind how do you tell whether what you're doing is helping or hindering. So the, 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 the person you just described, like sending their partner you know, job stuff, that's codependence. That's rescuing. That's them attempting to kind of to, to control their partner, not for their partner's sake, for their own sake, so that they can feel better. They want the partner to get a job so that they feel less anxious. It's, but the problem is, the minute you begin doing things for people that any grown-ass adult should be expected to do for themselves, you treat them like a child. You treat them as if they're incapable, as if they're somehow uh, deficient or insufficient. And nobody likes being treated like they're not enough, okay, or like they're incapable. You're basically saying, okay, you can't do this on your own. I'm going to have to do it for you, okay? And mm -hmm. that's not useful or helpful. So my recommendation is instead that you use this criteria. Would any grown-ass adult be expected to do the thing on their own that I'm about to do for my partner? And if the answer is yes, normal adults are expected to be able to find their own jobs, then don't do it for your partner. Cheerlead from the sidelines. So your job is to be a cheerleader, unless, as you rightfully said, Michelle, they ask you for support and help, in which case show up and show up in an empowering way, not taking their power away and turning them into a victim by doing things for them they should be doing for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so brilliant. It's so brilliant because I think it does come back to, you know, like in this example that I gave, she would feel more secure if he had a job. Mm -hmm. And so it's coming from her need and her wanting to control this and her wanting to quote unquote help or rescue is coming from her need, not necessarily from you what he so. needs. And he's going to feel, and in this case, did feel like she's like trying to control or treating him like he's not capable of getting the job or like he can't do it himself. And that's, that's something that I see happen is a lot of times when people get into this rescuing mode <laughs> or this helping mode, rather than it being appreciated, it's re people form resentment around that because they didn't ask for the help. They didn't want the help. It makes them feel like the other person exactly. doesn't think they're capable or competent to do it. Yeah. yeah. So fascinating. Like all these little things, you know, all these little uh, situations that can come up in relationships. So, Bruce, I want to just give you a chance to leave us like any last words. And uh, everyone that's listening, you can also check out Bruce's work at Love at First Fight. But any last words you want to give us, encouragement, thoughts, whatever. <laughs> sure. I think one of my favorite mottos in life is anything that isn't love is just a misunderstanding. And what that means is that anything that shows up in your relationship that appears to be unloving, it's just a misunderstanding. And I know this from more than a decade of speaking to thousands and thousands and thousands of couples. When we get into unraveling their arguments at the end, we almost always discover that it was a misunderstanding. So if you and your partner or the, your partner to be end up in conflict, or if you and somebody you love uh, does, you know, if somebody you love does something that feels bad, why don't you practice assuming a misunderstanding? And go to them and see if you can find out what's going on for, for them and listen. And I think what you'll find is that there's an explanation for their behavior that makes sense in context of how they see the world. And doing that, uh, you will reunite, repair and resolve whatever came between the two of you and your world would be a better place. And if you can pass that on to the rest of the world, the whole world will be a better place. And if we could do that for each other as countries, we might avoid World War III. So that for me is my, my biggest gift that I was ever given, learning that everything that isn't love is just a misunderstanding. Mm, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful note to end on. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, everybody watching or listening, uh, we hope this was valuable to you. And thank you so much for your time of uh, being Absolute here. Absolute pleasure. And can I say one more thing quickly, Michelle? I have a free online 
relationship health course where I give away a lot of my best relationship education for free. If you'd like to you know, learn about relationships, you're single right now, or you're in a relationship that's struggling, head over to Love at First Fight. That's fight with an F, okay? Love at First Fight. Dot com. Enter your email address in there. You'll get in my newsletter and I'll send you seven days of free videos where you'll learn a whole bunch of these distinctions for free. That's wonderful. Yeah. And we'll put that link in the description as well. Thank so you. thank you so much, Bruce. Uh, it's always a pleasure to connect with you and really appreciate all that you've shared so generously. It means a lot. Thank you. Absolute pleasure, Michelle. It's great to be here again anytime. All right. Thanks everybody for watching. Take care and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.